Okay, so last thing we had spitting out was that we've proven that we have our array of inputs, right? And we've also decided that any time we have an input that has a space in it, we're just going to, that's, that's the empty string, we'll just ignore it. All right, um, so that's kind of the scoop with that. Okay, so now we want to start processing our, um, our input. Now what we can do, if we actually want to see the shunting yard out room, which might be interesting, for us, we might decide to make it step through, one step at a time. Um, so for starters, uh, let's, because really when you, when you think about it, as we're processing the shunting yard algorithm, each step we're making a decision of what do we do with the, uh, um, what's on the, the, the input, right? What do, we, what do we do with the input? Do we push it right onto the op stack? Do we push it right onto the output stack? Or does something need to come off the op stack in order for us to push this in? I think most use with the operators, not the digit digitizers uh, push it to the mm -hmm. So what I want to do then is I want to create visual three stacks for us to add stuff to. All right? So we can kind of see those things uh, um, get, get added. And it might end up being a little bit uh, quirky getting this to work, but we'll, we'll figure it out. So I'm trying to take this a little bit farther than you did in your assignment, just to kind of have some fun with it. All right, so what I'll do here is in, in my interface here. Oh, it goes this route. All right, so this is going to be our answer. Our final answer is going to be here. But down here, we still have our vertical linear layout. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put a horizontal linear layout in there. Drag this down. Ooh. I want that guy to be at the bottom. Um, so that's my horizontal linear layout. And I'm going to make it take up the rest of the space there. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw some vertical linear layouts in there. So there's one, there's two, there's three. All right, and then I need to fix these guys up so they actually are sitting in the right place. There we go. So now we have three vertical linear layouts that live inside the horizontal linear layout. Okay. Now I'm going to go ahead, and just so we can label those guys, we're going to throw a text view in that one. We'll throw a text view in that one. And we'll throw a text view in that one. Okay, now we need to go ahead and we need to make the width, let's see, we're going to make the width of that guy wrap content, the width of this guy wrap content, and the width of this guy wrap content content and then we'll make the gravity of our um, horizontal guy be centered so they'll all kind of be centered in there huh say this again I thought uh, we could do that individually to center so that every. Um, well, what we could do is we can actually spread some of these out if we wanted to, or we could put some we could put some placeholders in the middle. So, for instance, I can put a um, text view. Put it right there. Oh yeah, yeah. There is a space. Good call. So we'll take the space. We're going to put a space there. And we're going to put a space there. 
All right. Um, yeah, good call. Good call. Very good call. All right, so we're going to make this text view. We're going to call this guy our uh, input. Oh, sorry. Come on. You got this. Uh, actually, let's call this guy input Q. We're going to call this guy our op Q. And we'll call this guy our output Q. And let's make the text a little bit bigger on these guys. So let's make that... Uh, Maybe 24. Twenty-four, twenty-four. And we'll make those guys bold. All right. So those are our uh, uh, things. Now, what I'm going to do is this guy here is a vertical linear layout. I'm going to throw another vertical linear layout inside of that to actually hold the contents because we're going to have to keep refilling it as we change it. Um, so you'll kind of see some strategies for doing this stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and down here, here's my vertical linear layout. I'm going to drag this guy in here. Okay? And I'm going to name this guy. We're going to call him the input Q. Uh, let's call it input Q layout. That'll, that'll kind of remind me what it is. All right. And we'll do the same thing for the other guys. So we're going to put another vertical one here. Okay, and that guy is our op Q layout. And then we'll do another one down here. And that's going to be our output Q layout. Now, all three of those layouts are vertical linear layouts. Okay. Um, now, one thing we might run into is we might have a situation where we have too many things in our queue and we can't see it. So I'm actually going to put all of that inside of a scroll view. So all of it will scroll. So I'm going to throw my scroll view right here. And then I'm going to throw... Oops. See, I'm in the horizontal right there. So that's my horizontal. I want all that to be inside my scroll view. So where's my scroll view? Scroll view there. I can get rid of that guy there, and then we can move this whole thing in there. There we go. And then we make the scroll view row, row. height is match parent. Well, let's back up. Looks like maybe we needed to do this. It's my scroll view. That's my vertical linear layout. Wonder why I did that. Well, you know, let's not get too caught up on that right now. Um, it could just be the way it's trying to lay out. I might have to go into the text and fix it, but let's not get hung up on that for this moment. So we'll 
because what will happen is eventually we'll have things that are too big and we'll have to make it scroll and it's easy enough to put it inside of a scroll view. There's just must be a weird setting that's happening. All right, so I want to give myself programmatic access to these three containers. Okay, so I can, I can do stuff to them. I can add stuff to them and that kind of stuff. All right, so what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to create a class built around a, this linear layout. All right, so we're going to come in here and we're going to call this guy a, um, let's call it a visual stack. All right, so we're going to have a stack data structure, but this stack data structure is actually going to have a viewport, something we can, we can see it, and it's going to be that layout. And that layout is already um, vertical. You know, so anything we put in there will stack on top of each other. All right, so um, let's go ahead and create this guy. So we'll say new Java class. And we're going to call this guy a visual stack. All right. Now, visual stacks, among other things, are going to have a view associated with them. So we're going to have a linear layout. Um, we'll call this guy the view. And we need to import that. And we'll have our constructor public visual stack. And this guy will take in a linear layout. Call it whatever. This dot the view is equal to the view. And then we talked last time that, uh, well, the video. <laughs> told you about stacks and talked about stacks have a top and uh, uh, so we have to keep track of the top of the stack which is going to be a node right all right so we're going to have a private uh, well, actually let's build a node first so new java class node and we're going to have a private string value and then we're going to also have a private, um, let's see here, well, private node, next node, definitely need that. But then we're also going to have a representation of our node, a visual representation of this guy, which is probably going to be a, uh, an edit text, not an edit text, a text view. Okay, so we'll have a private text view, the view. Okay, and when we build a node, we're going to have a public node string value. We'll say this dot value is equal to value. We'll say this dot next node is equal to null initially. We'll say this dot the view is equal to a new text view. I think I can, I might have to cheat here a little bit. I might have to give it a context. We'll see what it lets us do here. Is it going to keep screaming about that? Okay. Let me do some. Uh, do you have I? I think at least I do it in the first class. Uh, do you guys? We talked about uh, uh, design patterns. We talked about model view controller. Did I talk about singleton design pattern? Yeah. That it's a good idea to have one place that we share everything. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to create a singleton. I'm going to create a global class that I can store a context in, and you'll, you'll see how this works. So I'm going to create a new Java class. Now, actually, built into this, they have something called a singleton. I hate it. I don't like using the built-in singleton. It, the, the code it writes for it is inconvenient. So I like writing my own. So I like using and calling the singleton core. Like, it's a core place to store everything. Name it whatever you want. 
All right, now I'm going to say static context um, app context. And then here in our main activity, I'm going to say core.app context is equal to this. So I'm going to, um, I set our global variable inside of our singleton called app context. I set it equal to this activity. That way I can create a bunch of text buttons, text views based on that context. Because text views require a context to be made. So now inside of node, I can now say core.app context to create my text view. I, ne I needed that animal <laughs> in order to make a, uh, uh, a, a text view. Does that make sense? All right. And then what I'll say is I'll say this dot the view dot set text to this dot value. All right. So this guy will have a view as a parameter. Now I these guys are private, so I need to go ahead and give myself give myself uh, access to these guys. So I'm going to need to get a value, and then I'm going to need to get and set the next node, and then I need to be able to get the view. Okay, um, for right now, I, I don't think the value needs to change. So we're going to generate getters and setters. So we're going to do a getter and setter for, well, let me, for next node. Then we're going to generate a getter for both value and the view to give me access to those guys only. Not to change it, but I can read it. Okay, so there we go. I got my getters and my setters for to give me access to various node thingies. All right, so now my visual stack is going to have a top. So we have a private node top of the stack. We'll say this dot top is equal to null initially. All right, we need to be able to push things onto the stack, right? So to push something onto the stack, I need to be able to, I need to add it to the top of the stack, okay? So we're going to have a public void push, and this guy will take in a string value to push us something onto the, um, um, we'll actually probably have a couple of, Let's do it as a node. That way we don't have to write multiple versions of this. So I'll push a node in onto the stack. And what we're going to do is we have this new node. And this guy's going to become the new top of the stack. So we want this new node to point to the same thing that top points to. Then we want top to point to this guy. Does that make sense? That's how we build a stack. So we'll say um, n dot set next node to this dot top. And then we'll say this dot top is equal to n. That adds it to the top of the stack. Make sense? Then to pop, this removes the top of the stack um, and returns it. So in order to do that, we need to get the node we want to remove, which is currently top. So node, we'll call this guy node to remove is equal to this dot top. Then if this dot top is not equal to null, as long as I'm dealing with a real thing, then I need to update this dot top. So we're going to say this dot top is equal to this dot top dot get next node. So we go ahead and preserve the current top of the stack because that's the guy we're popping off. Then we update the top of the stack to be, to be his next node, which might be null, but it's at least not this guy anymore. And then we're free to return this guy, and he's no longer part of the stack. So then we'll return node to remove. Make sense? All right. And then lastly, and this isn't actually technically part of the stack data structure, but there's a function called peak which is a, it's a 
often seen in stack implementations, and it gives us the convenience of just peeking at the top of the stack. So we're going to have public node peak, and this guy will just return this dot top. We're not removing it. We're not manipulating anything. We're just saying here. <laughs> it's the top of the stack, and by the way, it's still the top of the stack. Okay, I didn't change the stack at all. I just gave you access to the top. Okay, and that's going to be handy for us to peek in and see what the top of the op stack is, right? Okay. So that's what our nodes are. And we're probably going to end up updating what a node is here in a few minutes. But right now we're working on kind of the visual side of this. Because all of you guys got your, you got the code working, right? Well, except for him, because he said he was sick. But generally speaking, we, we through heartache, you finally got it working. We think you understand the algorithm. So I want to focus a little bit on the visual stuff. We might still finish everything, but I want to focus on the visual stuff because that then gives you some more tools to work with when you're working on your apps. Okay, so here's my visual stack. We have these, uh, uh, these abilities here. But now, when we push something onto the stack, we also need to update our view. So not only do I want, so here's our view here. So after I've pushed something onto the stack, I need to add the visual of that top to the, uh, the view. So I'm going to say this dot the view dot um, add that view and I'm gonna add the view I'm gonna add is going to be this dot top dot get the view that's the view of that node and I want to add it at position zero add it at the top of my stack okay so really a, a, a vertical linear layout is already kind of a stack Right, as long as I treat it right. If I always want to put stuff at the top, I just add it at bucket zero. Over and over again, everything else gets pushed down. All right, so it's kind of convenient for us to take advantage of the fact that it automatically lays your crap out vertically. All right, now to pop something off the stack, we're removing it, and um, we need to say this dot the view dot uh, remove view at index and the index is going to be zero. So we logically moved it here. And actually, actually, let's put that code inside there. Only remove a view at bucket zero if there actually is a view at bucket zero. OK? Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. And then peak isn't going to change our view of our stack at all. The stack did not change. We just get to see what's on the top of it, uh, logically. OK, so now that we have this, let's go ahead and spin through our uh, uh, list of uh, elements and go ahead and push them onto our stack. OK, so here's our shunting yard. So our shunting yard is going to maintain three visual stacks. So we're going to have a private visual stack um, let's see here how do I want to do this uh, give me one second here core dot app context dot fine nope it's not gonna work no problem we'll just cheat again static um, activity, main activity. So I'm going to throw open core access to our main activity, which actually is a context, so I could have done it with just one variable here. Uh, and then I'll go into main activity, and I'll also set core dot main activity equal to this. So I'll have access to that guy from core. So I can use him to find views by ID. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. And really, from a programming perspective, this actually might be a little bit integrated. Like our, our pieces are kind of reliant in each other. Um, and that's actually uh, something called coupling. So with this in mind, our shunting yard object is coupled to our interface, 
You know, we've glued those guys together for convenience, but we do want to understand that because of that coupling, if we decide to break them apart, there's pieces of this that need to change. All right, it's just more of a decision, but we're not going to, we're going to still do it, but just be aware that that has ramifications. All right, so I'm giving myself global access to the activity so that within my visual stack, I'm sorry, within my shunting yard, I can go ahead and create my three uh, visual stacks with their respective views. All right. So we're going to have a private visual stack. Um, we're going to have our input stack. We're going to have our private visual stack op stack. And actually our input stack is actually a queue. So, so we need to be a little careful with how we add stuff to that. Then we'll see our private visual stack um, output stack. All right, and then we need to build those three guys inside of the constructor here. So we'll say this dot input queue is equal to a new visual stack, and this guy takes in a layout for this guy. And the layout I'll pass it is, um, we're gonna pass it the linear layout version of, let me import that, uh, linear layout version of core dot main, act, main activity dot find view by ID r dot ID dot um, what do I call it? Input Q layout. All right, so that's going to be that visual stack. This dot op stack is going to be a new visual stack, and that guy's going to be the linear layout version of core dot main activity dot find view by ID r dot ID dot op layout. I don't know why I call them all op queue, but whatever. This dot output stack is equal to a new visual stack linear layout core main activity dot find view by id r dot id dot uh, what's this one output output queue layout. All right. So are you are you following the reason why I put that activity the main activity up inside of core? Yeah. So that it gives me the ability to find the views in here? Because this dude is just a normal plain Jane Java class. He doesn't know how to find views. Right? <laughs> so I needed I needed that tool. Right? So we you know, so we we left the back door of Home Depot open so that we can, we can zip in and and, uh, and and grab the couple of tools that we needed here. All right, and, and I, I like doing this, and I, I like kind of evolving programs live in class like this because you kind of you can see that programming can be fun, right? I mean, it, this is fun, isn't it? Yeah, sure. But I mean, it, it is fun to kind of sit here and build this out and see it come together, and you feel like, oh, well, so this isn't that bad, right? Yeah. So I mean, you know, I, I want you guys to be able to appreciate that. You guys will be able to do this kind of stuff. I mean, it's just going to take practice. Oh, I mean, maybe in a week or two. Can we use this stuff what we are learning now in our capstone? I don't see why not. Because instead of doing something like, I have few guys who are into capstone right now. Mm -hmm. They are doing some application. In my opinion, I would say they are doing something which is very silly. Yeah. yeah. Most of them are unable to do and tomorrow they have their presentation, they, it, it's incomplete. Okay. And they don't understand what they have done. So instead, I guess this is something which is very interesting and it's useful to create an app. So yeah. my, this, would be, this would be my approach to that. Um, if you're interested in doing something more software based, like a creating a tool or something like that, which would be a little bit, you know, an issue we have right now, and kind of what you're saying here is, 
if you had come, you know, so your year, your second year MSIT right now? What? Okay. If you had just started the program here now, you probably would have done the MSCS. Is that a true statement? You, yeah. you probably would have done our master's in computer science rather than master's in IT because it's more, you, you, you find the programming stuff interesting, right? So we kind of have this weird overlap right now where there's some students that are too far into our master's of IT for it to make sense to go back and start over, right? Okay. Um, but I think we have some leeway where if you, uh, I mean, so you'll want to do this. You probably want to talk to Dr. Locklear first and say, you know, hey, I've enjoyed the stuff that I've been doing with the Android uh, stuff in uh, 537 and, you know, I'd like to maybe do something related to that in the capstone. I know that's a little bit, um, uh, like, maybe non-traditional for the IT capstone. But if, um, you know, you wanted to check with him before maybe you uh, make sure he was okay with that and get his okay and then approach Professor Hoppy okay. about it um, to make sure he's okay with it. Um, if they decide that... Uh, you know, Professor Hoppy wants to focus on the more IT projects, then I can just mentor you guys for your the programming projects. Okay. And I'm fine with that. But just kind of go through the, the, the process, right? Yeah. Talk to Dr. Locklear, make sure he's open to it. He can then present it to Professor Hoppy and find out, do you want to manage these guys or would you like Dr. Lippman to, to do it? You know, then everybody is comfortable with the situation because you don't want to undermine his projects. Um, but if you're interested in that, Dr. Locklear would be the person to, to talk to. And he's usually cool about those, those things. I just don't want to speak for him, you know, because <laughs> he's the boss. <laughs> Whatever he says goes, and we just all, you know. Yeah. But he's usually good about that stuff. So as long as you seem as serious about it and you want to do something interesting and we can just connect it to the IT capstone in some way, it's a utility tool for doing network something or something like that, it could probably work out. And if you want, when you, con when you contact Dr. Locklear, you can just carbon copy me on the email. Sure. And then I could follow up with him the next day. Or I can I'll text him that night or something. <laughs> Did you know he knows how to text? Uh -huh. Dr. Locklear knows how to text? No. We communicate with mail. I know. All right. What was I doing? Oh, yeah. So we're building our shunting yard thing. We take our input string. Our input string is going to um, create our three visual stacks, right? Then we went ahead and we have our process string guy here. Process string is going to go through and... Uh, this is where it's filling up our inputs. So after we have that, we want to go ahead and we want to add all those things to our input stack, all right? But we actually need to add them backwards because our input stack is actually a Q, right? So this array here, inputs, is we need to go through that from backwards to the forwards, skipping empty strings because those were false positives. And then we could push them onto our stack. Does that make sense? So we'll go ahead and we'll say add to input queue. So for int i is equal to this dot inputs dot length minus one. All right, so last legal bucket of that. Keep going as long as i is greater than or equal to zero i minus minus if this dot inputs at bucket i dot length is greater than zero if it's not the empty string okay then we'll do something with it okay and what are we going to do with it we're going to push a new node so we'll say this dot um, input queue dot push new node and our node class takes a value as a parameter inputs at bucket i I think it just takes a string value right 
Yep, constructor of that takes in a string value, and then it creates the string, sets up the next node, instantiates a view for that guy, and sets that guy's text to that. Uh, to that. Okay. I'm lost. Okay, so this guy will go through our uh, input array backwards, pushing each non-empty string element onto our input queue, which makes our input stack act like a queue, <laughs> right? Because we, we're going to feed, we're going to feed off the front of it. So we'll be popping stuff off, but we added them in reverse. That way it'll, it functions as a queue, even though we're doing it as a stack. All right. And then we, we don't need this guy anymore, so let's get rid of that. All right, so that is our process string. So now when we instantiate our shunting yard, this guy will go ahead and grab our three stack layouts. Um, we don't need this. We don't need this. Then this guy will call, uh, we actually probably want to call process string after we have our layouts. Process string will go through and do our tokenizing crap, blah, blah, blah. Um, then we're going to go ahead and add it to our input queue, which should get a bunch of text views on the screen if everything worked to plan. Okay. So let's go... Back to main. When we call our process button, we're creating a new shunting yard. We're passing it the text. It's going to go and do all that crap, and we hopefully will see our inputs in the, the order from top to bottom, right? Let's see if that is the case. So let's do 123 plus 42 times 8. Then we'll click process. 123 plus 42 times 8. Legit? Okay. Um, now, uh, just to make sure things are working the way we want it to work, let's kind of me mechanically exercise this a little bit. Let's pop a value off our input queue and push it onto our op queue. Then let's pop a value off of our input queue and push it onto our output queue. Let's make sure that things move around. Make sense? So come back in here. Go into, since right now we're doing that inside of shunting yard. After we've gone ahead and pushed everything onto our input queue, let's go ahead and say this dot output stack dot push this dot input queue dot pop this dot op stack dot push this dot input queue dot pop so pop a couple things off our input queue toss them into our other guys just to make sure the interface moves around the way we want it to move around all right All right, so we'll process that. Okay, doing what we want it to do. All right. Okay, now it... Yeah, let's leave it. I would like that text to be a little bit bigger, but uh, let's see, is that... I think there's just a text size attribute. Um, you know, let's not screw with it. I don't want to waste any time on that. We'll make it bigger later. Okay, so we'll take those last couple of things out since now we know we can do that stuff. Okay. Now what we want to do is that guy's going to process the string and fill our input uh, queue. In fact, maybe instead of calling process string, maybe we call this guy fill input queue. That's really what that guy does, right? He fills our input queue. 
So we'll change the name of it here, be a little bit more modular. That's all that guy will do. He parses out the string with our tokenizer and stuffs the stuff into our input queue. Okay, and our input queue is actually an instance of a visual stack, which is a stack data structure with an interface. That makes sense? All right, so now what we want to do is we want to give ourselves a, a next button. And when we hit the next button, it'll read the next token from our input stack and then do the right thing with it. So we should be able to say what should happen next. And when we hit next, we should see it happen. That make sense? Okay. So we're going to, this is exciting. So, all right. Yeah, that's why I like doing Android in here. I've actually started doing Android in the 535 class now, earlier. Like, as soon as they don't seem like they're just scared to death. Yes, we get the <laughs> interface too, how to create the responses and how to program them. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, what was I doing? Oh, we're going to put a button, right? Let's see, we're going to make this. All right. Um, so let's go ahead and maybe put that button below this text view, but above the horizontal guy. So that's our output dude. So we'll put it right there. And we'll have this guy, uh, we don't need to name him anything different. We'll have this guy say next step. Row, row. that was weird. Next step, okay. And then we need to create a function for that guy inside of our main activity. So we'll say public void next step button pressed UV. All right, and just so we are confident this thing is uh, well, I think we'll know what works. Um, so what's this guy going to do? He's going to talk to our shunting yard. So this shunting yard right now, his, his scope is local to this dude right here. What we want it to be is we want it to be a global variable. So we're going to make this guy private shunting yard sy. And then we'll say this dot sy is equal to the new shunting yard. That way we now have access to it in here. Okay? So when we say next step, we're going to tell our shunting yard to take the next step. So what do we mean to take the next step? We mean look at the next value on our uh, um, on the input stack. and So look at the top of it and decide what do I do with it. That's right. Yep. So uh, let's go and write that. So we'll go into shunting yard. And we're going to write, uh, this guy's going to be public because we need to be able to call this guy. Right? So let's do public void next step. Um, yeah, let's leave it like that. Ooh. Nailed it. All right, so public void next step. So this guy's going to check the top of the uh, input queue and make sure there's something there, okay? So do we have more work to do before we actually do the math? If this dot input queue, which is a visual stack dot peak is not equal to null, if it's something other than null, we have more work to do, right? Else, time to do the math. That make sense? All right, but we're going to work with just the top part for right now. We'll be in there for a little bit. All right, so we're going to look at that top value. Let's go ahead and uh, um, we'll, well, we have access to the top value, but let's just give ourselves a local variable. Um, so we'll have a node temp 
is equal to this dot input q dot peak. So we haven't actually uh, popped it off there. Uh, although, you know, we could. We're going to need to pop it anyways. Um, yeah, we might as well pop it. Because we can always push it back on if we changed our mind. So let's just go ahead and do the pop right now. So we've removed it from the top of that stack. And now we need to decide what to do with it. Okay, so we need to identify it as either being an operator or being a um, non-operator, <laughs> right? <laughs> an operator or a non-operator, okay? Um, so we need to have a list of our operators. So inside here, and actually, why don't we do this inside of core? We'll teach core how to identify operators. Uh, you know what? We're not going to have to do this anyplace else in the code. It doesn't make sense to put it in core. Core is our singleton. You should only put stuff here that needs to be used in other aspects, like across multiple screens in our app. In this case, all of our uh, none of our other classes need to check whether something is an operator. Just this one guy does. So we'll keep it inside of Shunting Yard. But we'll make it private, this function private, because it doesn't need to be accessed outside of this. So we're going to have a private boolean is operator. This guy will take in a, um, let's see, are all of our, oh, we'll have it take in a string s. It's good enough. And we're going to have our operators. So we're going to say string ops is going to be equal to plus minus times divide open close power. Are those all our operators? And then we will return ops dot index of s not equal to negative one. So if it's not equal to negative one, that guy is an operator. So index of searches this string ops, so the string that looks like this, for this string s. And it returns either the position where that string begins or a negative one if it was not found. So this guy will boil down to true if it was found, if it's something other than negative one and false otherwise. Make sense? So this is a, a function that will test to see if something is an operator. So we'll ask the question, if this dot is operator, and now I need to get the value contained inside of the node. That is temp.getValue. So if that value is an operator, then I need to do operator stuff. Else, do um, value stuff. All right, and what does do value stuff do? With a, if it's a value, we always push it on to the, uh, the, the output, output queue, right? So we're going to do, we're going to say this dot, um, what we call it, output stack dot push temp. That's what happens if it's, if it's a value. Now, if it's an operator, well, I called it op output stack. So we're just kind of using those words interchangeably. Yeah. Is the value just pushing output? Who? I said if it is a value, just push it to output. Yep, if it's a value, push it to the output. If it's an operator, we need to check to see if we're allowed to put it into our op stack. So we need to peek at the top of our op stack, and we need to determine the precedence of those operators. That makes sense? So we know that our operators all have precedences. Now, if we wanted to be fully object-oriented, we probably should have had our nodes hold, um, uh, instead of strings, hold these values that have a, you know, whatever. But, but uh, you know, so what I'm going to do here is we're going to have a private Boolean get, what's it called, get priority, get precedence. Precedence. I spell that right? All right, and then we're going to have a 
string what's it called? It's called a hash map. Yeah, I think it's called a hash map. So we're going to put the key plus sign. I'll explain what this is doing. What's the precedent of those guys? So plus and minus are two. Um, times divide are three. And then power is four. So that guy is going to be two. Yeah, so we, depending on how we want to do this, um, we probably want to, we can say that everything else is a one. Negative one is fine. All right, so in a lot of other languages, this is something known as a dictionary. So it's just a whole bunch of name value pairs. So I've put into this dictionary that a plus sign is a two, a minus sign is a two, a divide, a, a multiplication is a three, uh, divide is a three, um, so on and so forth. And what it'll do is it stores those integers in there. I'm pretty sure I can put it directly as an integer like this. I don't have to actually say new integer, but we'll see. And then what it'll let me do is it'll let me um, extract the precedent of that guy. So we're going to test this. So when I, if I pass it a plus sign, it's going to say, go ahead and return the value at key plus sign and then give me the integer value of that guy. Because he's actually gonna come out as an integer object. I want it to return an int. All right, so let's test to make sure this does what we think it should do. Um, so we're gonna do this here inside of next step for the moment. So let's go ahead and say system.out.println. Uh, this dot get precedence plus we'll just do this for all of them 
minus times divide power, and then let's do our couple of parentheses. Times divide. Oops. Open, close. So these guys should give us a couple of negative ones, right? Okay. Um, all right. And then we need to make sure we call next step from our main activity. When the next step button is pressed, we're going to say this dot sy dot next step. Every time that guy is pressed, Let's go ahead and hook this button up for the on click. So there's our next step button. Here's the on click. And I'm just not even going to trust it to begin with. <laughs> We're just going to do that. All right. So this guy right now should. Uh, at least output our precedences, just proving that we're getting kind of the right values out of that. All right, 123 plus 13, doesn't matter what we do. We'll say process, that fills our stack. Next step, so two, two, three, three, four, negative one, negative one. So that's grabbing our precedences for us. All right, perfect. All right, so we'll go back in here now. Hide that dude. Go back to shunting yard for next step. So we know we're good there. So do operator stuff. Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to get the precedence of the top operator. So if this dot opstack dot peak. is equal to null. If there's nothing currently on the top of the op stack, push the op, right? So there's no competition. <laughs> so we're going to say this dot op stack dot push, and we're going to push temp onto that op stack, OK? Else, we need to get the, uh, the precedence of the guy at the top of the op stack, right? So um, we're going to say this dot op stack. Well, let's do this. This dot get precedence of this dot op stack dot peak dot get value top press. So that's going to be the precedence of the current top op. Store that in a variable. Now, if the precedence is what? The precedence of our new value, so actually it's going to that. So int new press is this dot get precedence of temp dot get value. So those are two precedences. When are we allowed to, when do we want to push on top versus when do we want to Pop first, then push. If the precedence of the guy in the steam or in the op queue is lesser, then we have to push it out. Lesser or equal. If the queue is lesser, then we have to push it out. If it is more. Okay, go back to our example here. Yeah. When we had, we're adding seven. Then we're multiplying 4 times 12. So how, what would the order of these things come into? So we had 12. Then we had multiply. Then we had 4. Then we had plus. Okay. So we could not put a smaller precedence on top of a larger precedence. We can put a larger precedence on top of a smaller one, but if the current, if the new precedence is greater than the old precedence, 
we need to we need to push right otherwise we need to pop until it's not right so what we really need to do is we need to pop from the op stack until we no longer have a top of the op stack whose precedent is greater than the guy we're trying to push on right uh, greater than or is it greater than or equal to if we have multiplication and division, the multiplication should go on top of the division. So greater than or equal to, we're good. Less than, we're not good. So we need to keep popping as long as the guy on the top of the up stack is greater than the guy we're trying to add. Yeah, just greater than. All right, so let me do it this way. I'm just going to give myself a variable called top press. And then we're going to have a do while loop. I'm going to set top press equal to the current top of the um, uh, of the of the op stack. Mm. You know, we're going to write it back the other way. It would be better. If top press is greater than new press, then we need to do the pop thing, right? Uh, no, if it's equal to, we're allowed to put the guy on top. So if we had a division, we could put a multiplication on top of that, right? But if we have a uh, addition, we could put a multiplication on top. But if we had a, a multiplication, we could not put an addition on top. So if top press, this guy, is greater than the guy we're trying to add, then we need to get rid of this guy first. Yep. So if top press is greater than new press, we need to pop and try again. Yep, pop, pop, but we don't just pop and push. We pop and potentially try again, because we might have to pop several things before we can finally get the dude to land. So we'll pop and try again. So now we'll say top press. If it's greater than new press, then we're going to say um, this dot output stack dot push this dot op stack dot pop. So we'll pop and push that guy onto there, but then we need to try this again, right? So what's the next thing that happens is we need to say, uh, let's see, we do it this way. So we're going to say, uh, the correct loop to do is a do a do while loop. Let's force ourselves to use it. It'll be fine. I started doing that before and then I stopped and I'll do it again. So do No, I still don't want to do it that way. We're gonna do it as a while loop. while top press is greater than new precedent, we'll do our swap, then we'll update top press, 
um, so we're going to say um, if this dot opstack dot peak is equal to null break because we're out of stuff now else top press is equal to this line right here. So we'll get the new top precedent. All right, so we'll get our original top precedent, and we're only in here if there actually was something at the top of the stack. So get the original top precedent, then we'll get our new guy's precedent, and as long as the top precedent is greater than the new guy's precedent, we're going to pop the top precedent off, push it onto the output stack, then break out of this loop if we're out of things in the op stack, or set top precedent to the new top precedent of our output stack, spin back up, ask the question again. So we'll keep popping crap off and pushing them onto our output stack as often as we have things that should. That make sense? Okay. So that's what that guy will do. When we break out of here, we can finally <laughs> add the new op. So now we can say this dot opstack dot push um, this dot uh, no we just called temp we already stored it push temp now we may not have done any popping in here make sense okay so as long as the precedent um, fits we'll do that now we are going to have to do a special case in here I believe because we'll have to look at how the parentheses are supposed to work yeah, we also have to look at the power uh, thing because that's actually uh, right. Yeah, so it's, but let's just see this work initially. Okay, so this is for our next step. So our first several next steps should be moving stuff around, right? All right, so let's go ahead and run this. All right, so we have 123 plus 13 times 8 um, divided by 2. Let's do something like that. So we'll go ahead and process first, so we get our guys there. When we take our next step, what do we expect to happen? 123 to the output queue. All right, so far so good. Next step, what should happen? Plus uh, The plus to the op queue. Okay, what next? 13 to output Q. Okay, what next? Okay, so multiply has a greater power than the plus sign. So a greater than or equal to, so it's allowed to go on top there. So there's the multiplication on top of the plus. 8 goes on top of the 13. Divide. Yeah, it'll go there. Yeah, it'll go on top of the multiplication because it's less, it, it's greater than or equal to. Yep. Then two goes into our output queue. All right. And I can just keep hitting this again and again and again because we're in that else that currently doesn't do anything. All right. All right. So now the else says we're supposed to do some math. right now do Say this again. If we put input string like 1, 2, 3 multiplied by 13 and, and 8 divided by 2. Yeah. So, okay. Um, let me change one thing real quick because one thing we need to do is every single time we hit process, we need to tell all of our uh, uh, cues to empty. Well, actually, no. I think, I think will this work on its own anyways? Here. This will do it. It's a little, this will be a little cheat. Um, new visual stack. So we'll do it inside the visual stack here. We'll do this dot, the view dot, remove all views. So when a visual stack is first created, he'll go ahead and empty out his views in case they ever had stuff in them before. 
That way, when we run it multiple times, it'll uh, uh, we won't have values from the previous things stuck in our stacks. All right, so here I'll process it like that. We can do a bunch of next steps. All right, now you wanted me to change this to what? Yeah, one, two, three, multiply. Okay, so now I'm going to hit process again, which should clear out our, let me hide the keyboard here, which should clear out the stuff down here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> now it'll clear out the stuff down there. <laughs> All right, so one, two, three goes over there. Okay, 13 goes over there. Now the plus should not be able to go on top of the multiply. So we should see the multiply come off and go onto the output queue and then the plus go onto the op queue. Make sense? All right. Uh, then there's our eight, there's our divide, there's our two. Okay. So far so good? All right. So now let's let's get this let's get this math working. Then we'll deal with the parentheses, those those couple of special cases, right? All right. So now let's go ahead and process our output queue. We're inside the else. We should do some mathy stuff, right? All right, so uh, what, what, uh, uh, how do we process that Q? Well, we pop, we'll pop the two off, we'll pop the eight off. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, no. Actually, hold on, the next thing we should do, since we're out of output Q, is we need to clear op Q. Yep, so, we, so inside that else, we need to do some extra crap. Uh, let's see. So, so we're going to say do um, output. Let's see. Does output Q have stuff in it? Uh, hold on. I'm in the wrong place. Do, do, do. Yeah, let's do value stuff. So now here we're, so next thing we need to do is say, um, else if, this dot, output stack dot peak not equal to null, Clear. Oh yeah, it's op stack. Thank you. Clear the op stack. So we'll say while op stack dot peak is not equal to null, we're going to go ahead and so technically that next might do several things because it's going to clear the op. Uh, stack and push it. So we'll say this dot output stack dot push this dot op stack dot pop. Then else we do this stuff. That makes sense. All right. So let me run this again, and we'll that, that way we'll be left with the math stuff. All right, so we'll process, take all of our steps here. Now when I hit next, it should clear the op queue. All right, now we should be doing the math stuff, right? All right, so the math stuff says to do what? It says first we're going to add, then what are we going to do? Oh, well now we're going to divide. Uh, that takes two inputs, so we're going to say two divided by eight. Um, Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we need to make sure that this guy is the first operator. They're they're there in the right order. We just need to know the how the order the parameters need to come in as. So the second guy is actually the one where is the uh, what did, um, 
the first guy is the divisor. The first guy is the div what's the what's Divisor and divisor, dividend, dividend. Di no, dividend? Dividend and divisor. Eight All right, eight's the dividend, two is the divisor. divisor. Yeah, good. Nailed it. <laughs> All right, so um, we say we're going to add, so we're going to do some math. But then the next thing we read was some more math. So now we got to do that more math. So we're going to do math again. Then we hit this guy, and we hit this guy. We do 8 divided by 2, so now we're done with that math. Then we have another math. Okay. Now, to me, as I'm walking through this, this is screaming recursion. Okay. Do math. I hit an operator. That means I do math. Oh, I hit another operator. What do we do when we hit an operator? We do math. That's what we do. With an operator, we do math. All right, so I'll get this guy, and then I grab my next operator, which should be something, right? And what does he do? Well, that guy's a number, so I don't do math on numbers. Okay, I use numbers for the math I'm currently doing. All right, so we need uh, we need to write some do math. So here's our time to do the math. So we're going to give ourselves a little private function down here. So private int do math. Okay, and this guy's going to take in a string op as a parameter. Okay. Um, actually, let's think about this. Just tell it to do math. Actually, I'm not going to have it take in a string op. Yeah, this will work. So inside of do math, we're going to look at the top of the uh, top of the stack, right? And uh, we need to get a value off the top of the stack. Say this again. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But only if it's not an operator. So we already have a way for checking, checking the operator. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to just take the top of the the, the stack off. Okay, we're going to look at the top of the stack. In fact, actually, you know what? I am going to do this as a... I am going to have that guy taken an op. Because what I'm going to do here is we're going to go ahead and we're going to say um, if not this dot is operator... This dot output stack dot peak dot get value. If the top of the output stack right off the bat is not an operator, that means that either they gave us an illegal string, but we're not error checking, so we're going to assume that everything they gave us is illegal. That means that what they gave us must have just been a number, right? So we'll go ahead and just grab that number. We're done. So we're going to set this guy to hmm. We're going to we're going to give ourselves that text file. So private text view output TV and we'll have this guy also pass in actually we can do this dot output TV is equal to the text view version of core dot main activity dot find view by ID r dot ID dot output TV. I mean, we're already coupled here, so we might as well just <laughs> do the rest of the stuff in here. Um, so now this guy will have access to that that output text view. So if we're here, we can just go ahead and say this dot output tv dot 
set text to this dot output stack dot pop dot get value. That's our answer. So it'll clear our output stack and put our answer on the uh, um, the the other guy. That makes sense. Okay. So now else there is actual math to do. Okay, that's what we got. That's what we got there. There's actual math to do. Okay, so with actual math to do, what do we do? Well, we have a operator, so we're going to tell it to go ahead and do some math. Now, yeah, I love it. There's really two ways of doing this. We can do this using stack operations. And then always push our answer back onto the stack rather than having it return a value. Yeah. I think that's the way to do it. So we'll, we'll, have, it, we'll have it take in an op. So we're going to say this dot do math of this dot output stack dot pop dot get value. Because we, we can burn operators. We don't need operators anymore. So Because as we get them, we're going to use them. Okay. So we'll tell it to go ahead and do that math. So we have an operator. We pass the operator in to do math. Okay. Do uh, an operator requires two operands, yeah. right? So we're going to go ahead and get the uh, um, op two and then op one, right? Now we know, actually, we don't necessarily know. So we'll say um, um, if this dot output stack dot peak dot two string. We're going to use this guy. We're going to say if that guy is an operator. So if the top of the stack is an operator, then we're going to go ahead and we're going to say do math. This dot output stack dot pop dot to string. That's if it's an operator. We'll call do math again. Else, if it's not an operator, so we have int op2, int op1. I just put them in the backwards order because that's the order we'll be getting them in, right? Mm -hmm. So we'll say op2 is equal to, uh, and actually, why don't we go ahead and get these initially as nodes? That'll be a node with a value, right? Um, oh, you know what? I think we're, we're okay. Let's do them as ints. Yeah, we're okay with this. We'll get this as an int. So we're going to say integer dot parse int this dot output stack dot pop dot uh, actually two strings, not the right thing. It's called get value. And this is get value. For some reason, I think I did a two string someplace else. No, oh, I said get value, get value. Okay, I think we're okay. So we're going to parse the integer out of the top of the output stacks get value. All right. And then inside here, we need to ask about um, op, the, the second operator. So now we'll say if this dot uh, hold on, we need to so this asks the question is the top of our output stack An operator. If it's an operator, do this stuff. If it's not an operator, do this stuff. Right. 
what the issue is is I'm going to end up pushing this back onto the stack. I don't want to get my stack out of order here. Yeah, rec recursion's dangerous here. Yeah, we're not going to we're we're not going to do recursion. Recursion's dangerous here. So we're going to say while this dot output stack dot peak dot get value So we actually we actually want to just keep we want to keep processing the stack until the stack has one element on it. That's really what we want to do. We want to keep processing the stack until there's just one element on it. That tells us when we're done. So I think what I'm going to do here is in Visual Stack. We're going to have a private int count. So let's just make that guy. Well, no, let's make it private. So we don't want it to be changeable. We'll say this dot count is equal to zero. Pushing is going to say this dot count plus plus. Popping is going to say only if we actually remove something, this dot count minus minus all right and then we want to get a getter for our uh, count all right so now we have our count so then I'm back here um, we So now we don't even need to do that guy up there because we're going to just have while this dot output stack dot get count is greater than one do stuff. Okay, so if it's greater than one, we know that the current top of it is an operator. All right, so um, if it's greater than one and it uh, there's an operator there. We need to go ahead and grab the operator, and then we're going to call do math on that operator. And that guy's job is to just do that math, because he's going to ultimately do, he's going to take the plus, he's going to take this number and this number, add them together, push the result back onto the stack, because okay, we're doing all the math um, on the actual stack. Um, but what if there's a number with uh, one plus two plus bracket? Yeah, this this will handle it because so we're gonna have our our recursive stuff, but it's not we're not gonna do it all recursively. So we're gonna still have do math here. So we're gonna have a private, um, actually we're gonna say private void do math. We're not gonna return a value from this guy because at the end this guy's just gonna push the value back onto the stack. Um, and uh, so do math is going to take the top of the stack, which is an operator. We know it's an operator, so we're going to say um, string op is equal to this dot output stack dot pop dot get value. So there's our operator. Then we need to get our operands. So if this dot output stack dot peak dot get value if that guy is is an operator get is operator this guy then we'll call do we'll call this dot do math again which will manage that operator okay then when that guy returns we when he whenever he's finally done he will push his answer back onto the top of the stack. So we know when we're right here, we now have a number at the top of the stack. 
If math had to be done for an operator, it's now done. Now I'm here and I can say int op2 is equal to integer dot parse int of this dot output stack dot pop dot get value. <coughs> that makes sense? All right. Then if this dot is operator, this dot output stack dot peak dot get value, this dot do math. Then we'll say int op one is equal to integer dot parsent. Actually, we just steal this line. All right. Now we'll actually perform the math associated with the oper the, the operand. Um, so if op dot equals plus sign, we will this dot output stack dot push a new node and the new node is going to be a value that value is going to be the empty string plus um, op2 plus op1 like that. So we'll build a new node around that math. Else if minus, we do the minus. Else if times, we do the times. Else if divide, we do the divide. Um, and let's see, we are handling power now. Well, we're not really handling power now, so let's let's not do the logic for power because we don't have the left and right stuff at this exact moment. Yep. Um, no, plus, oh, 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 yeah, I gotcha. Divide. There we go. And then that guy will naturally end. So right now we assume we'll all we only use plus minus times divide for our algorithm. So while the output stack get count is greater than one. Oh yeah, this is concatenation. That plus is I'm taking this math and I'm concatenating it onto the empty string because building a node requires a string. Yeah. All right, so we'll say do math. It's like if you blink for a second, you forget what you're doing. <laughs> well, I don't know what I'm doing. All right, so that will do the math for it. And then as soon as we exit out of here, we know that the top of the stack has our answer, so we should be able to say this dot output TV dot set text equal to this dot output stack dot um, pop dot get value. I think. All right, let's do something easy first. So, we, we, so 123 plus 6. <laughs> that should give us a 129, right? So we'll do process. All right, and then we'll do next step. There's our 129. All right, now let's do times 3. Uh, so that should be, that's, <laughs> that's going to be 6 times 3, which is 18, plus 123, uh, so 141. Oh, 
All right, uh, divided by two. Uh, and this will actually give us integer division. So 141 divided by 2 is going to be, uh, what, 70? No, it should be 18 divided by 2, 9 divided by 1. Oh, oh, you're right, you're right, you're right. 18 divided by 2 is 9, so this should be 122, uh, 132. Yeah. Hmm. Oh. They did the math right. Why did it do it this way? Yeah. Yeah, it got it, it did the three divided by two first and got the zero. So actually, actually it didn't we have this slightly wrong. We need to add an equal sign to our um our processing shunting yard. Yeah, you were right. While well, it's greater than or equal to, we need to pop. Because that multiply and divide can't happen in the wrong order. Good call. I was testing you. You were the only one who got it right. All right, so let's process this again. Well, let's see. Okay, multiplication. There's our three. So now we expect the multiplication to pop and the division to. So that's correct. Yeah, that's correct. So then we have the two. Why don't we take like two plus six? All right, so we do math on the plus, then we do math on the divide. So that's going to be, um, and we do these backwards, so then we do math on the, the two. So that's op, uh, op two is two times, so now we're doing math. On the 3 and the 6, so 6 times 3 is 18. That's going to be op 1. So 18 divided by 2 should be 9. Um, and then we add that 9, that's the original call to do math, to 123, which should give us, well, that, that should be right. Right, but it's doing it. This is correct right now. This is the order they should be in. I'm adding, then I'm dividing two, well, I'm dividing uh, this guy by the two. And this guy is, I'm doing the multiplication first, because that's the left, right? So 6 times 3 is 18, divided by 2. That's the correct order. That's the order that should be happening in, right? Yeah. All right, so uh, it's got to be something inside of our do math, because this looks correct. Our stack is correct there, so now it's our processing of the stack that's uh, funky. All right, so do math, we get the top op. If so here, let's just trace through here. So this is this will be our plus sign. This will be our plus sign right here. Then we grab our next guy, which is actually divide. Well, let's follow through and see what the actual code is doing. Okay, we know what the code's supposed to do. Let's see what it's actually doing. The math is, bit, uh, the math is right. I, I mean, like, when we go 1, 2, 3 plus, it should multiply 6 into 2 and then. No, this math is correct. The way this math, I mean, we should do 6 times 3 and then divide that by 2. That's how we should do math. No, it 
will be and if we will have like six multiplied by three by two, first thing goes like they should have equal denominator. But by that they have the six and two has equal. No, we're not these aren't fractions. Like they are all separate. Yeah, these are just numbers. Yeah. So I think this is correct. So now we just need to walk through and look what our code does for that. So our code here first grabs this first op, which is the plus sign. Then it asks, is the top of the output stack, which is currently the, the divide, is that guy an operator? Yes, it is. So what do we do? We call do math on that guy. So this copy of do math gets put on hold. So we call do math again. We grab the top of the stack. So now op here is the divide. Is the top a operator? The top now is the two. No, it's not. So we're going to set op2 equal to that two. Then we're going to ask, so we pop that off. So now the top of the stack is this guy right here. Is that guy an operator? Yes, it is. So what do we do with operators? We call do math. So we call do math again. So this is on hold. We're up back here and do math. Op is equal to the multiplication sign. Then we ask, is the top of the stack, which is currently a three, is that guy an operator? No. So we get op2 is a 3. Then we ask, is the top of the stack a, uh, uh, a uh, operator? No, top of the stack right now is a 6. So we op1 is a 6. Then we do the math. So we have op, which currently is the multiplication symbol. So if op is equal to multiplication, then push on to our output stack. This might be actually where we're having problems. Uh -huh. So if we're, if it's multiplication, we're going to add op2 or multiply op2 by op1, giving us an 18. And then we're going to concatenate that onto the empty string, giving us the string 18. So then we'll push the string 18 back onto the top of the stack. So right now the, our stack looks like 18 and 123. That's what our stack should look like right this second. Then this copy of do math ends. So we pop back up and now we're in the copy where op2 is a 2 and we're sitting right here. Op1 is now an 18. Okay, so op1 is an 18. Op2 is a 2. Our op is the divide. We come down here to divide. Divide says take take op2, which is 18. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, 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 that's right. No. No, it's not. It's backwards. This is taking 2, and it's dividing it by 18. It actually should be 18 divided by 2. Is it like the expression which we are inputting? You know what? I think this will just fix it. Multiplication didn't matter. Um, subtraction, I think, is already going to be correct. We'll double check that, but I, I think this will just fix it. Um, so now let's look at subtraction. So let's do 123 um, minus 2 should give us a 121. And that'll just tell us whether subtraction needs to be reversed as well. Yeah, it does need to be reversed. So this should be op1 and op2. No, in this case, we need to check a condition. If op1 is greater than op2, then we say op1 minus op2. Else, op2 minus op1. Okay, so the first operator is bigger than Well, no, because that's not necessarily the way it should work. I mean, uh, it should go left to right. So our operations need to happen in the correct order every time. Sometimes you will get a negative number. You, your logic is trying to guarantee we don't get negative numbers. Sometimes you will. Yeah. I mean, a negative number is acceptable. You know, sometimes you'll get one. But in this case, it shouldn't have been negative. Yeah, in this case, it, 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 did, it did it the wrong way. Let's process, next step, next step, next step. 
Next step, and there's our 121. Okay, go to 2 minus 123. Yeah, 2 minus 123 should give us a negative 121, so we'll process that. Okay, so we're going to call that a pretty complete app. Couple of little, couple of little things in there. Huh? It shows every single step inside the screen. So let me do this for starters. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to uh, share this project on GitHub so you guys have access to it. When I'm trying to share my project on GitHub, it's saying GitHub.exe. Well, let's see if that happens to me. No, this is working. The moment we click on the GitHub uh, option, it gives an error saying that git.exe is missing. Hmm. You mean to import it from GitHub or to do what I just did? To check out what you did. Okay, yeah, I, I've seen that happen before. So I think the way to do it is uh, this. Um, here, let me copy this first and I'll put this up on Slack. No, that's not us. We are 537. So there's that link on Slack. And this is in the public 537 uh, channel. Now your guys homework assignment for next class, and I can actually let me do something here real quick. Here is the Wikipedia for binary trees. So your assignment, this next assignment, it deals with uh, uh, binary search trees, but a pretty simple example of a binary search tree. So a binary search tree is a nonlinear uh, linked data structure, so it looks like a tree, all right? But the stuff is stored in order. Notice everything to the left of the two. Um, actually, this is a bad example. That guy's not a binary search tree. This is better. Let me give you this link. Yeah. Binary search tree. So here's the root node, 8. Everything to the left of that is less than or equal to 8. Everything to the right is greater than 8. So when you first start your tree, the, the root node was 8, let's say. And when we added the 3, the 3, we said, well, is this place taken? Yes, it is. So is 3 less than 8, or is 3 greater than or equal to 8? It's less than, so we'll try to drop it over here. Okay, so you guys will have to implement a binary search tree, but instead of holding numbers, your binary search tree is going to hold patient records. So think of it like a, you're almost like implementing a database, and a simple one. So uh, if we open up the assignment here. So implement a binary tree data structure capable of holding patient records where a patient record is a collection of details about a patient, including their first name, their last name, and their age. So three pieces of information about a patient. All right, your binary tree should place patient records based on their age, where smaller ages are to the left of the root node and larger ages are to the right of the root node. Okay, and you can decide where the equal goes. Do you, is, is the left less than or equal to? Is the right greater than or equal to? But the equal sign can only be on one of the sides. You want right. the same uh, will apply to the child and those two. If we are at the, from the main node to the left, then the child will be the same. So if we are at the from the main node to the left, then something value, uh, whatever value comes to the left, so it will again go right and left. Well, yeah, because one of the principles of a search tree is that every subtree is a tree. Yeah, they're all trees. Okay, so you just keep, so if I'm the root node, I'm already taken, and the value I'm trying to add is less than me, I'm going to go to my left node and say, add this. 
If I don't have a left node, now he's my left node. If I do have a uh, left node, I will ask my left node to add this new value. And then, he would and then he will do the same job I just did, and he might pass the buck. And eventually, things trickle down. All right, so after you've, uh, so I say test this by generating 100 patient record objects uh, with random ages between 5 and 85. So you'll generate a random number between 5 and 85 um, for your, so you can, you can name it, you know, uh, patient first name one, patient last name one, age 17. Patient first name two, patient last name two, age 63. You know, whatever. You just generate random ages so you can fill out these guys. Um, so do 100 of those, put them into your tree, then add the patient, uh, uh, let's see. In the end, your program should display uh, the patient records, that the one that's in the lower left of your tree, which should be your youngest patient. Okay, the patient record at the root node of your tree, which is your first patient, <laughs> and then the uh, patient record in the lower right of your tree, which should be your oldest patient. That makes sense? You don't have to draw a tree. I just want evidence that you put stuff in your tree correctly is going to be that you should have a pretty young guy, a pretty old guy with a hundred of them, you should have a, a decent range of values between five and eighty-five, and then the guy in the middle is going to be whatever. We, you know, we, depending on your randomization, you might have a tree that's very heavy on the left side or very heavy on the right side, and we're going to be talking about uh, tree balancing stuff next time. Sound good? And then the paper is. Um, dealing with potential uses for binary trees in modern software development. So a place you might look is in databases. You know, because I kind of just mentioned you, you might be representing these in databases, but there's plenty of other uses, but you'll find a lot of stuff dealing with databases for that. Sound good? All right, so what did we decide about uh, next week? Are we, do you want to meet on Monday or do you want me to give you the video? I think I'm going to video. Video worked out okay? Okay. Uh, and I, I mean, I'm going to be out of town for Thanksgiving, but I'll be in, I, yeah, I can check stuff. So if you guys have questions or you need to do a video chat or something like that, we can do that. You know, sound good? Yes. Okay. Uh, let me stop this and get this uploaded.